so much. <laughs> okay. So before we get started with our presentations today, I want to thank Alyssa Soto Sanchez, who's here, and Anthony Stepper for all that they have done to make this day possible for us to arrange the space and the graphics and just setting everything up and the refreshments over there. Um, and of course, I also want to acknowledge all those who are now one step away from completing their master's degrees. Thank you for all your amazing work over the past two years. I'm so delighted that I was able to work with all of you, or well, with all of you in some capacity, and some of you more closely than others. And finally, I want to extend a special welcome and expression of gratitude to the community of loved ones who helped to make this day possible through your support of today's presenters. Every parent who offered encouragement uh, and made a, a meal, perhaps, every friend who proofed a paper, every partner who watched a child or shopped for groceries so that these students could spend the time that they needed to in the library, writing, doing their research, and in some cases presenting their uh, early findings from their research at conferences and in other settings. So thank you for all of that support because you also made this day, day possible. Um, before we get started with the presentations, I also want to note that we have some awards to acknowledge. For the past several years, News has given an award to highlight the work of graduating students whose research and projects during their time at News have made significant impacts in the realm of social justice. The two, of, uh, the two people that we are going to offer these awards to today are Leanne Lean and Natalie Ayala. We deserve all of that applause and more. We solicited nominations from your peers and instructors, and here are some of the things they had to say about why they felt you deserve these awards. With a focus on the Latinx community on Chicago's South Side, Nat is collecting and sharing oral histories and recipes related to food justice. Their continued advocacy and commitment to community engagement and social justice needs to be recognized. And then uh, another uh, comment was, I strongly recommend Leanne for the new Social Justice Award. Leanne's thesis offers a class-based institutional critique of art interpretation strategies in contemporary art museums. Leanne produced a substantial archive of oral history interviews that document museum workers' involvement in labor unions at their respective institutions and how this involvement served as a catalyst for a food conscious, oh, sorry, a class conscious revision of museum labels. And I was jumping ahead to the next part. <laughs> <laughs> so there are many here, many comments. I'm gonna read just two more. Nat's capstone brings attention to the food justice movement through the use of Latinx punk pedagogies and specifically through the distribution of zines. It relates to museums through the exploration of alternative modes of display, including a digital online zine archive, wearable items, and a workshop. It's an ambitious and brilliant project from an engaged scholar, cultural worker, and artist. And finally, about Leanne, Leanne deserves this award for her contribution to the research and support of museum workers' rights. These awards will be announced formally at the graduation uh, ceremony hosted by the College of Architecture, Design, and the Arts, but we also want to acknowledge them here today at this capstone symposium and celebrate these accomplishments with all of the people who are, are joined with us today. It's always hard to pick these awards because so many students are doing fantastic work. So just know that we appreciated all the nominations and we value all the accomplishments of everyone here. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Anthony Scepter to get this symposium started. And I'll be back up here at the end with some closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Therese. So it's been my pleasure to work with these students for two years, some of them longer because of the admissions process. Um, and this is the culminating event of about two years of work uh, by these students. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time up here. Uh, I'm just going to call the first, um, I'm going to call the first presenter, which is Nat. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. As I was introduced, my name is Nada Ayala, and I am going to be a graduating new student as of tomorrow. Um, and I'm here to introduce my new capstone project, Talmo Style Punk, um, this community distribution project, which in its final form became a series of scenes 
Buttons and Interactive Works explores the use of Latinx punk pedagogies as a way to transform traditional limitations of museums and sites of exhibition. Functioning as an oral history project and archival project, Mosel Punk explores the Chicago environmental justice movement, alternative forms of display, and community-centered distribution in the museum through five Latinx punk pedagogies that I've identified while working on this project. Before I officially begin this presentation, I invite you to engage with the materials that were passed around, um, which were zines and buttons, and all of those are free for you all to keep. And yeah. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation. Oh, and then also, I also like to acknowledge that Dr. Therese Quinn and Dr. Rosa Cabrera were, were both helping me throughout this project, and they were a lot of help, so that was awesome. Um, so, yeah, so my intention of this project were rooted in bringing together two movements, which are not often thought of as parallel movements, Latinx punk and the environmental justice movement, both of which are rooted in working class, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx lived experiences. By looking towards these movements as radical frameworks, we can, we can work to transform traditional notions of museums and exhibition sites by prioritizing the histories and lived experiences of communities. And to explore this, Moselle Punk is rooted in two questions. One, in what ways can Latinx punk pedagogies be used to transform our traditional notion of museum spaces and exhibition? And two, how can we use those pedagogies to highlight the work of current working class and communities of color in the Midwest resisting capitalism through their prioritization of environmental justice, food sovereignty, and arts-related land practices as forms of community care? So why did I choose Latinx punk pedagogies to guide this project? In part, Latinx punk has, as a pedagogical framework is something that I've been working on since my undergraduate thesis. So this project really allowed me to continue years of work and apply it to the Jill Museums. So one of the first steps in this project was identifying those Latinx punk pedagogies through that would guide this project. So the pedagogies which are shown on this slide um, are not the entirety of the potential of Latinx punk as a pedagogy, but are what I've identified as leading themes throughout Latinx punk. For this, I used a combination of historical analysis, archival research, and my own lived experiences to choose the five pedagogies. By intentionally using Latinx punk as a framework, as opposed to white American punk, this honors the Black, Indigenous, Latinx, immigrant, and working class origins of punk, while also challenging the notion that, that punk is exclusive to whiteness. Ooh, sorry, one more thing. And then within the scope of this project, both Latinx punk and the environmental justice should be viewed as socio-political frameworks, both of which significantly differ from their mainstream white canons. Both Latinx punk and the environmental justice movement take into account the structural, social, racial, and economic inequities that disproportionately affect low-income Black and communities of color in the U.S., both movements prioritize the lived experiences of working class, low-income, immigrant, Latinx, Black, and Indigenous communities. Both movements also often utilize anarchist slash leftist tactics in their mobilization efforts and have roots in working class ethos. Using Latinx pedagogies honors the politicized histories of both Latinx punk and the environmental justice movement, which, like many social movements, do not necessarily have a pinpointed date of origin, but rather come from collective memory, mobilization, and activist efforts. So how did I conduct a project with a scope this large? Um, throughout this project, it was really important to me that I utilize Latinx punk pedagogies in every step of the way. This included during the research, the creation, and during the distribution of what would become the final version of this project. So as stated, I identified Latinx punk pedagogies while prioritizing intentional community collaboration and community-centered distribution. I conducted interviews on a trade-based compensation, which, in exchange for people's time during the interviews, they were compensated with a color copy of Marcel Punk and an art item created by me based off the interview that we had together. In the end, this intentionality led me to me choosing to make the final form of this project a zine titled Marcel Punk, which is what was being distributed. Um, zines, which have, been his, which have historically been self-published and often used as a tool for intervention into the mainstream, allowed me to uh, the distribution of the, this project Moselle Punk would become not just one static form, but took on multiple forms, including physical zines, an Instagram page, a Spotify playlist, free buttons, and many zine versions of Moselle Punk. And you can actually directly scan all of the QR codes on this slide if you're interested. Um, and it will lead you to the Spotify and the Instagram. And so now I just wanted to briefly go into what is Moselle Punk zine exactly. 
So through the intentional use of zines, I wanted those engaging with Moselle Punk to challenge their traditional limitation. Sorry, that was my bad. Um, through the traditional use of zines, I really wanted to those engaging with Moselle Punk to challenge their yeah. traditional limitations and expectations when it comes to engaging with material publication. Moselle Punk was really meant to be written on, to be torn up, cut up, colored it, and distributed. It wasn't meant to just sort of be in its final form that I presented to you. It was really meant to be interacted with. And so in total, Moselle Punk is about 50 pages long. It's about half sheet size once it's folded. Um, and it includes a Moselle Punk manifesto, kind of words that I identified as important to know from both, both museum studies and Latinx punk, and also community interviews and other types of Latinx punk histories and environmental justice histories. And also a big part was the fact that almost every page on this in the zine is collaborative and it's meant for you to interact with in some way. And so now this is, so how do you imagine the future of museums? So in April, I had the opportunity to table at the Unearthing Creativity Earth Day Festival at the Latino Cultural Center here at UIC. And the event brought together local artists and community organizations engaging with environmental justice through the arts. And so at this event, I was actually able to sort of do a soft launch of Museo Punk before it was completed. But so basically, sorry, my notes are a little weird. Um, so as you can see in the photos, on the bottom half of the slide, um, I was actually able to provide like a collaging and mini zine activity, um, and I was also able to distribute free myself on buttons and mini zines and full size zines. And right above that, if you can see with the thought bubbles and the cats, I was actually able to also engage with the local communities that came to the event. So I offered three printouts of how do you imagine the future of museums? And through that, the public was able to engage and they kind of wrote in how they wanted to see museums transformed and changed. And so that was really important to me that while most of the answers were different, there was an overall theme of calling museums to be more inclusive, less racist, and to return stolen objects mm -hmm. um, to their communities of origin. So here we really see the use of Moselle Punk itself as a strategy and intervention. And then so just kind of to bring this presentation to an end, I really hope to continue to utilize Latinx and pedagogies as a framework to radically reimagine the limitations of museums and sites of exhibition, um, while also honoring the radical legacies of Latinx punk, which have never been exclusive to whiteness. And if you'd like to see the full version online, or if you'd like to follow our, my Instagram or the Moselle Punk Instagram, let's get it here. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia Chimino. I'm here to present my Capstone project. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Therese Quinn for being the head of the committee chair and Dr. Maria Lopez Garcia for being my second committee member. All right, for my Capstone project, I structured my research to focus on the question, how do university affiliated museums attempt to engage with the community? First, I'd like to start by briefly um, defining what I mean by community as it can be many things. Um, for this project, I define community as the surrounding publics of the museum area, and not just those who attended the university that the museum is affiliated with. Um, I chose university-affiliated museums specifically because I feel that university-affiliated museums have a deeper responsibility to equitable practices of cultural and intellectual material dispersal due to the dual commitments stated by both universities and museums to social justice-based community engagement. I activated this idea during my site selection and chose only places that had made public statements committing to community engagement and equitable practices throughout their institutions. The museums I chose to study are the U Chicago Smart Museum of Art, Northwestern's Block Museum of Art, and Gallery 400 at USC. I chose these museums specifically because of their mixed statuses as both private or public institutions, as well as the geographic variance they offer around the city. Right. I set out looking for ways I could measure community engagement for any museum. I came to the conclusion that I first needed to choose what my criteria consisted of. Based off of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility statements on each museum's website, I was able to devise four tenets of community engagement that included museum-specific facets. These were programming, accessibility, inclusion, and belonging. In order to measure these tenants, I utilized a mixed method approach with both qualitative and quantitative forms of data collection. 
I first started by using participatory action research, which was in the form of a survey. I polled visitors on their feelings of access, accessibility and belonging at two of the sites. I then used discourse analysis and analyzed the museum's websites, advertising, and looked at programming and inclusion practices. Then I used autoethnography to place myself, the researcher, as a participant in the study. Lastly, I utilized post-structuralist feminist perspectives and Marxist frameworks. Using the chart on the right, I and scored the data from each museum in reference to the definitions of each community engagement tenant I stated earlier. The results came in with Gallery 400 scoring the top with 7.75 out of 8. They scored highest in accessibility and inclusion in comparison to the other museums. Then comes U Chicago in second place with the top score in belonging. And lastly was Northwestern, mostly because I wasn't able to fully score them because I was not allowed in to post my survey in their area. Um, the results of my data collection indicated that with no perfect score, that there's certainly room for improvement at every site I spent. Concluding from this research, I have come to understand that the museums who seem to excel at community engagement, according to visitors, are the ones that seek to listen, provide empathy and human connection, and give space for conversations between museums and those they seek to serve. The quote I have here is from Nuala Morse's book, The Museum as a Space of Social Care, which was my guiding literature informing my shifting perspective of what community engagement means in a museum space. I highlighted specific actions that can be taken by museum workers to engage with communities and create personal connections. My personal favorite is the sharing cups of tea and <laughs> make them small talk and hold it hands. Um, <laughs> using methods of social care to seek a deeper, more authentic form of community engagement, university affiliated museums will be able to provide a space for all members of the community to gather, learn, and grow together. My next action is to enforcing this chart, this change involved discussions with museum workers about my findings, including the presentation of this capstone at the Inclusive Museum Conference in Toronto. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Abdel Lowry, and today I'm going to be talking about my capstone research project that I titled The Surveillance of Disabled Bodies and Autoethnographic Accounts of Accessibility Challenges in Chicago Area Museums. Um, my committee members consisted of Dr. Therese Glenn of the news department and Dr. Terry Sandall, who is in disability studies. So I will start by talking uh, briefly about my research question, the methods that I used during my project and a few relevant definitions for my research. So my research question is as follows, how do accessibility challenges impact visitor experience in museum spaces? And to conduct this research, I use a combination of critical visitor reports, accessibility policy analysis, and autoethnography, which is a method that allows for researchers to use personal experiences. I have a few relevant definitions that guided my site selection for this project. So the first one is the International Council of Museums or ICOM's definition of a museum, which, um, sorry, I lost my place. They define museums as nonprofit institutions that are open to the public in the service of society. I also use the Americans with Disabilities Act definition of a museum, which encompasses a wide range of sites, including historic sites, botanical gardens, aquariums, planetariums, children's museums, and science technology centers. The vast majority of museum spaces in America are covered by the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. They are required to comply with min minimum guidelines as defined by the ADA. I also included the ADA requirement for museums. They require that museums have to have accessible entrances, barrier-free routes throughout the space, public elevators, appropriate signage, alternate formats for printed materials, working auxiliary aids and services, and they have to have websites that are screen reader friendly. So for this project, I visited five sites across Chicago using two different mobility aids, my Olinker, which is the device you can see on the left in the photos, 
and my mobility assistant service dog, Cammy, who is the cutest member of our cohort. <laughs> <laughs> so I first visited the Art Institute of Chicago over two years ago now. I was denied entrance based on my choice of mobility age, which is a direct violation of the ADA. Um, I was later given an apology and um, like free admission, and they told me that they were going to be updating the policy to include my mobility aid on their website. It has been over two years, and that has not happened. Then I went to the Museum of Contemporary Art for a critical visitor report for one of my classes, where I was followed and harassed by a security guard because of my linker again. The MCA also has an inaccessible parking garage, and when I visited, the accessible entrance was blocked by construction, which made it very difficult to get in. So the third site I visited is uh, UIC's own Gallery 400, which is by a large margin, the most accessible and inclusive museum that I surveyed for this project. They seem to be making a very concentrated effort to schedule accessible programming. They really make an effort to include image descriptions on all of their social media posts, and they're the only institution that still requires masks in the gallery space. Um, next, Cami and I visited the Chicago History Museum, where we didn't have any real access issues other than a security guard asking me if she was a service dog, which they're allowed to ask me. And I said, yes. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I'm sure. So after that, we didn't really have any access issues, but it was a notable change from Gallery 400's inclusion and celebration of disability in this space because the Chicago History Museum has an entire exhibit dedicated to famous Chicagoans. And there is no mention of disability in any of the exhibits that I saw. Um, so to conclude, I want to emphasize that accessible programming is a necessity and a suggestion. True accessibility goes far beyond the ability to enter the building. Accessibility means considering, including, and celebrating disability in museum spaces. As museums continue to change and evolve at the times, accessibility needs to remain at the forefront of all of their exhibits. Um, exhibits need to be barrier free. They need to include visual and audio descriptions. Promotional materials and programming needs to be made accessible and disabled stories need to be told. Accessibility for the disabled population improves visitor experience for everyone. So as for the future of my project, I have written a series of seven blog posts detailing my experiences and accessibility suggestions for all of the sites that I visited. Um, it will be hosted by the Bodies of Work blog, which is the link on the screen, um, which is the Disability and Human Development um, Department's blog. They have not yet been posted, but they will be housed here. So I'm hoping that the blog posts will be um, interactive and engaging and we can create some tangible changes at all the sites that I surveyed. So thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah Marriott. Um, I'm obviously finishing up the master's program in the MUSE program here at UIC. The advisors for this project, this thesis, are Dr. Lucy Mensa, Diana Fritt, and Dr. Therese Pin. So my guiding question for this thesis is how can museums display textiles in a way that is dynamic, tactile, and educational for the viewer? The current textile kind of standard of display um, in large museums is there's no there's little information about how the objects are made. Textiles are often displayed like this behind glass in low light. So seeing an item clearly is challenging. In many cases, textiles are placed in extended storage only after a few months of display to preserve their integrity. And the existing conservation literature recommends these practices. Larger art museums prioritize collecting and conserving works over their educational, cultural, and experiential value to the public. So, example of a quilt um, displayed at the Met Museum in New York, basement gallery, super dark in there, you know, kind of difficult to see the work. And this is the extent of the information. You can just kind of see it in the corner. That's it. And so there are other museums that have presented textiles in a much more dynamic way. So obviously here we have the Art Institute of Chicago, their textile gallery um, from a recent show. And, you know, it's very basic information. These are textiles from all over the world. They have so many different uses and they're displayed in this kind of, you know, 
very standard format. Um, small textile museums and what I would describe as craft museums, forefront modern textile art, and offer visiting public classes, more information on how the object was made, and interactive exhibitions. The MAD Museum, which is in New York, um, displays these kinds of exhibitions. So this is Tabernacles for Trying Times, um, collaborative work, and the visitor is allowed to kind of walk through the space, you know, they're it's more well lit, as you can see, and obviously it's interactive because there is, you know, an area that was designed by the artist for visitors to come and sit. Um, the center also, you know, it regularly shows these kinds of works. Um, another really kind of dynamic display was Sonia Clark's monumental cloth, the flag we should know, at the Philadelphia Fabric Workshop and Museum. Um, this stands out as an exhibition that is particularly visitor-oriented and interactive. Monumental Cloth invites the visitor to add a few wefts into a textile work representing the Confederacy's dish club flag of surrender. Wefts are, so wefts in a piece are the threads that run, you know, back and forth, and warp are the threads that run up and down. Just to give you a little bit of context. Um, the center also offers textile arts classes for both children and adults. And it was kind of what makes it these kinds of um, museums like the textile workshop and museum, they just have the know how to do it. They have the looms, they have people who can set up the looms and they have, you know, textile arts professionals. So this thesis is not complete, <laughs> not as yet, but I do have some ideas as to where to go and kind of expand it a little bit. Um, so I might research a little bit more into some larger interactive fabric installation work. This is Andrew Rodino by Ernesto Nieto, um, displayed at the Fifth Avenue Armory in New York. Uh, it was this huge exhibition with like a massive textile gallery. And there was like a ball pit in there that children could play with. Very cool, very interactive, very like visitor focused. Um, so that might be a way to go about expanding this project. And I think it's important to kind of maybe connect this project to the current environmental crisis. Textile waste is a huge issue at the moment and museums might be an excellent space to do classes on repair or reuse, something like that. Um, this might contain a toolkit also for museums with suggestions on how to redesign their galleries so they are interactive and visitor centric based on the examples from before. Yep, that's pretty much it. So at this time, we're going to have about uh, 15 minutes of uh, Q&A for the first four presenters. So we'll take a short break, and then the last four presenters will come up, uh, and we'll, we'll keep the process. So we're just going to get set up. So uh, who has a question in the audience? I'll get us started. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it okay if I'm not using mine? Yeah, the mic's not working. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So Deanna, I was really struck at the end of your presentation. I know your project's not completed yet, but you mentioned sustainability practices. And I wondered, right away, I was thinking, oh, fast fashion. But then I thought maybe there are other kinds of things that bring your mind. And if you could talk a little bit about what you hope visitors uh, experiencing fabrics in a different, less traditional way might come away learning or, or knowing. You know, um, I think... So I've kind of been thinking about this for quite a while. Here in the States, we used to have a lot more like home economics classes that were taught in public schools. That's totally vanished. And I mean, for good reason, like they were kind of like sexist and stuff like that. But most people now have no idea how you make a garment. And I feel like that's, that's a loss that you don't know what you're buying. And so you don't really think critically if something's good quality or if it's gonna last a long time where you just don't respect the labor that has gone into, you know, an item of clothing. Um, and that might be a space for a museum to come in, offer sewing classes and other skills that were taught in home ec classes, but just aren't taught anymore. 
That's a great point. I, I love that. Um, I wanted to just add to that. I had conversations about this when I traveled to Finland oh, yeah. because there they offer home ec and it's a totally gender inclusive thing. It's not just for girls as it was when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, so everybody loves it. They said it's the most popular class because they, everybody learns to cook and they get to eat what they cook. People get to make their own favorite clothing, you know, so very popular. Anyway, thank you. Other questions in the audience? I'll ask a general question. Um, your projects, most of, if not all of them, seem to result in recommendations for things museums could be doing differently. So I wonder if each of you could just briefly talk about what you see as being the impact of your work. Where, where do you find, how do your findings get shared? Do museums respond? <laughs> what, what happens with this um, really interesting work you're doing? Sir first, yeah. Um, so in terms of my work, every all three of the museums that I work with asked me to share my data with them. So I think what my plan is to send my data, but also have a lot of all the information I learned about like collecting data and how it can be more like beneficial to the community and things like that. So I think like promoting more conversations between like me as a researcher in the museum is what I intend to do. And then also like going to conferences and things like that. Sure. Um, my project actually came about when I was denied entrance to AIC, I went home, like went back to my hotel room and wrote a uh, post on Facebook that went a little bit viral in the community of a linker users, which is the device that I used. And because the social media attention was like getting some traction, AIC emailed us back and was like, well, yeah, yeah, we'll change it. We'll offer you free, re like a uh, free entry and free entrance into the ticketed Monet exhibit. And, you know, they were, they were very apologetic and saying that they were going to update the policy right away and get things done. And, you know, nothing came of it. So in writing my blog post, I'm hoping that the blog post component will maybe sort of mimic the social media pressure a little bit. If I have it published on a website where everyone can read that this is what you did badly, I'm hoping that that will maybe create some positive change. Um, we actually have to reach out to a couple of the sites that I surveyed because the Bodies of Work and Disability Studies Department works with a couple of those institutions. So we're giving them a little bit of a heads up about what is going to be posted. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that actual tangible changes will come about based on like public shaming, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's my hope. <laughs> well, I, you know, I just think textiles are really underutilized in the museum. You know, you go to big art museums, especially, and they're always like tucked away in some weird little gallery. And it just feels... One, it feels kind of sexist because textiles are generally considered to be like women's art. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but that's really how they're seen. And, you know, like you go into the main galleries and they're just full of paintings and sculptures by all these dudes. Yeah, I think like with my project in particular, well, I think I first will say that I feel like Muse is a really, really unique program where I feel like all of us within the program are very critical of the role of museums and are very conscious of the fact that museums are heavily rooted in like colonial, like white supremacist, like ideas of like display and like, like, like community and like control on these things. And so I feel like a lot of us are really like museums should change, or should be like completely transformed in like a million ways. But I feel like with my project in particular, it's less about asking museums to change and more about us as a public understanding that what we value about exhibitions and what we value about art spaces and art museums, we can often find in our own local communities. They're just not recognized as exhibitions or they're not given that validity of like, oh wow, this was a successful exhibition because it happens outside of an institution. And I feel like that's where my project really calls for institutions to not only change, but to have like these really important reciprocal community relationships where it's like, it's one thing to ask a, a, ask a museum to make an exhibition that's inclusive. And it's another thing for that exhibition to truly reflect the needs and the wants of the community in a way that is not exploitative and, uh, you know, like kind of isn't just like 
a publicity, publicity or like very performative for the museum. Especially right now, we talk a lot about how like social justice really is a big buzzword, right? Like people are really, you know, like companies and corporations are getting called out, but it's also like, how do you make those changes within institutions that are so rooted in like these really colonial white supremacist, white supremacist practices? Question in the back. Um, for Hannah, um, have you considered museums in other countries? Because I'm thinking of the textile museum in Oaxaca mm -hmm. and the way oh, yeah. they, they deal with textiles, the histories behind it. It's I've seen beautiful exhibitions there. I I was recommended that museum by Diana, and I just I just want to limit it to the U.S. because there's just so many just so many museums out there that are doing really amazing work, but. I think from a systems perspective, we have like a very specific kind of museum system here where there's a, like the big encyclopedic art museums and then there's the little art museums and, you know, it is my frame of reference personally, I don't, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, sure it would be amazing to go see those museums too, but just the ones that I've seen, yeah. Question? I was interested if you guys would be able to speak to um, how maybe your research or your project changed while you were working on it and potentially how this might inform your work moving forward. Sure. <laughs> um, well, I think as, I mean, anyone in my class knows my project changed <laughs> a lot because I was initially looking at something just entirely different about coloniality and um, things like that, but I think that, I don't know, it was, I feel like I learned a lot just knowing that I had to like pivot really quickly and be on my feet. And there are just so many, like it wasn't hard for me to kind of learn issue to look at. There's just so much going on that you can critique and things like that. Um, my research changed. I initially wanted to do 10 sites, but you know, time, there was just not enough hours in the day for me to fit <laughs> and survey 10 sites in the manner that I wanted to. So I narrowed it down to five and then I switched from a thesis to a project so I could write the blog post and make it a little bit more publicly accessible. Um, I, I initially really wanted to do a thesis, but I'm hoping that because the blog post will live on the internet, they will be able to reach a wider audience. So yeah, that's how I managed. I, you know, I kind of set out to do this thesis on textile display in the museum. Maybe it evolved a little bit in terms of its content, but this is kind of something that I've always been thinking about. Um, maybe originally I was going to look more at clothing or something like that because that's my background, but I think textile art, you know, is, it's kind of amazing in the way that it feels so human or something. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I kind of briefly mentioned in my presentation, but Latinx punk has kind of been an interest with in academia since I've been an undergrad. But I guess I think that was more because I was like in academia, I was like in college, and I was like, what am I gonna do research on? And I wanted something that felt relevant to me and wasn't something that I felt like I just wanted to like co-opt and like, you know, like just be a part of for the sake of academia. So really focusing on Latinx punk for these past few years has been like really cool and really interesting just because I've basically been able to just like talk about my lived experiences through my work as an academic and like as like a scholar artist in a lot of ways. Um, initially, my project was really focused on like Latinx punk pedagogies within museum education, um, just because I am like also a teaching artist and so education is a, specifically youth education is like a really big part of my work. Um, but like recently, this in the past year, I really got into like environmental justice and like a lot of my circles have really been expanding to like reflect just like more of what most of punk currently is. But I also think that's cool in terms of like decolonizing research is that like research doesn't always have to be like this like really far off thing like I think it also can just be like reflective of the communities that you're a part of and like I definitely made Moselle Punk just for the purpose of being able to distribute it 
to like my friends and my circles. And like, of course I do have like larger scopes and larger ideas for it. But at the end of the day, I really made it like, you know, like I would say that I'm like a Chicago pop artist, but I like really made this from like a Chicago top perspective to be able to distribute within Chicago. Um, so yeah. Now, would you say a little bit more about the like punk pedagogies that you mentioned when you start, I think you mentioned five? Yeah, so I chose five. So the way that I was structuring my project was I was guiding using Latinx pedagogies as like a framework of like teaching basically and like learning. Um, and so I forgot the five pedagogies that I exactly chose, um, but I chose like, right, like it was focused around like autonomy and agency, cultural preservation, political resistance. Um, and one that was really important actually was DIT instead of, so like instead of DIY, I actually learned of the term DIT from one of my friends, Brianna, who's from West, who's from Michigan. Um, and they, in their punk circles in Michigan, have been using the term DIT, so do it together instead of do it yourself, you're doing it together in the community. Um, and they've been using that phrase for like years. And they're like, yeah, like everyone in Michigan uses it. And I was like, I've never heard that. Like that is so cool. And they're also like, they're like a Dominican punk, you know, from Michigan. And so like a lot we have like been talking about, and a lot of their experiences are like pretty similar to like mine. And it was just like, it was just like interesting, I feel like in that sense to meet someone who I hadn't met before and kind of be like, hey, I'm like working on this project. These are the things that I'm interested in. And they're like, oh yeah, like we do all the same things in the little punk scenes in Michigan. Um, and so like from that term, I like was able, like that became one of the guiding pedagogies for my project was like the DI, like the do it together. Cause I also feel like with my project, the public distribution was something that I thought about before I even was like making the project. Like I really was like, who am I gonna give it to? Like, how am I gonna distribute it? Like, I didn't wanna make something that would just live as like a document that never gets read, um, which is like respectable and that was like my undergrad thesis. Like I feel like no one read it, it just like 90 pages that lived on my laptop. Um, so like with this one, I really was like, I wanted to make it intentional through its distribution while still utilizing those like Latinx pedagogies. We have time for one more question, if there's another question in the room. In the back, yep. Hi, Anthony. Um, anyways, I am really <laughs> inspired by all y'all's research. And I was wondering, just sort of for each of y'all really quickly, what was like your favorite thing that you found while you were working that really gave you hope to like get through the rest of the project to finish? Because it's so easy when you're researching stuff that like directly relates to your experience and the things that you're really passionate about to get so bogged down about like how bad it can be and how like deeply rooted a lot of these like oppressive systems are in museums and I was wondering like if y'all had like a certain moment or a certain thing where you're like yes this is the thing I am pushing towards. So I'll just repeat the question which was uh what during this process gave you hope to push through as you're doing all of this sort of critical work what gave you uh, hope to keep going and looking through some of the difficult uh, subject matter that you're addressing? Um, I can start again. <laughs> um, so everyone has heard me talk about this so much, but the one book that I mentioned at the end, Lala Morse's book, I think was my like, oh my God, I can actually finish this project because I found with, like a researcher that was looking at exactly what I wanted to be doing and had like completed it in a successful way and wrote a whole book about it. Um, but in addition to that, also like all of you guys, like seeing everyone else doing projects and we all have like very similar mindsets and what we want to accomplish. So that was really nice to have, you know, a whole cohort of people and faculty and everyone. Um, I'll be honest, my project was real hard at times, <laughs> um, writing about your own experience like as a disabled person and being told just really intense things, being harassed by security guards, getting denied entrance, things like that were really intense at times. So the thing that gave me hope was at a show at Gallery 400 that was called Crib Asterisk that was organized by a disabled, uh, disabled curator and it featured a lot of disabled artists. And it was a really beautiful exhibition that just celebrated disability in a very public and joyful manner. And so that was the first time where I was like, okay, museums can do this. They're just not trying to. Mm -hmm. So it gave me hope and also like a little bit of fire to like say that this is what they're doing right. And this is how we should be modeling their practices after mm -hmm. this. So, yeah. I don't, I'm 
I don't think I was at any point kind of hopeless about my project. A lot of larger museums, you know, not even talking about craft museums who have always really forefronted textiles in recent years have put on kind of amazing textile shows. There was a Beats of Butler show not too long ago at the Art Institute of Chicago. You know, I don't think, I don't think there's like a point where I feel hopeless about this. I feel like a lot of museums are trying to forefront textiles more. They just need to do it more often. You know, I, I think there's a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, well, one, I think grad school is hard. Grad school during the pandemic, <laughs> during the pandemic is also hard. So I think, cause it's not just about like producing projects and like producing something and like getting a master's degree. It's about like making sure that like you, like you're okay throughout that entire process. Like I definitely agree that like having a network of support is so important. And I think both the, like those networks of support being inside an institution and outside of an institution institution is very important like I think like us even just as a cohort like we relied on so like on each other so much just to like get through classes and to like get through the semester it's because it's hard you know and it's like a lot of us are like working and have like other stuff going on so it's not like right it's not like you're an academic and that's like your entire life. like that's not true um like even like Abby became a content editor for Mosea Pong and like they literally, it was fun. yeah, like, they literally like I would like email them at, like three in the morning. I'd be like, can you look at this? And they're like, yeah, I got you at like eight thirty. And so right, and like those like kind of supports are really is what makes or break it for a lot of people. Just because it's like it's hard to get through grad school by yourself. Like you do need those networks of care and those networks of support to be able to get you through. And I also think at least with my project, what because there was a point where I'm like, oh god, I'm like, this is gonna get done. Like I feel that with my project, it was also really about just like where do you want your project to end up? For me, I'm less interested in like traditional academic stuff. So like, I was like, I need to finish this because the people I interviewed, I want to be able to give them something, you know? Like, I don't want to like waste people's time in the sense of like, you know, like you did this for me. So like, I want to ensure that I could give something back, but in like a reciprocal kind of way, like for caring for one another. So I also feel like just like the fact that I was like, I want people to like, be like, oh my God, this is so fun and so cool. And like we could do cool and fun stuff and still be inside of that community. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for joining me and thanking these and congratulations. Hi, my name is Lexi Oliva, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm discussing my capstone project entitled Building a Neighborhood, Engaging Youth with Urban Design Through Museum Education. My project is co-chaired by Dr. Therese Quinn and William Estrada, both affiliated with the School of Art and Art History. Um, just to provide some background as to what led me to this topic, you know, I am a lifelong Chicagoan and I've always been interested in the concept of a neighborhood. Many people from Chicago can attest that there's a lot of ownership and pride that comes from what neighborhood you're from. Um, that's because despite being a diverse and complex city, um, a lot of people's experiences or the experiences of being in a neighborhood are incredibly insular. Um, it's at a neighborhood level often that impacts your access to resources, including housing, education, healthcare, safety, and even just a general sense of belonging. There's also this increased interest in both uh, the fields of urban planning and architecture to start introducing these concepts to students and youth from an earlier age. So I think museums in Chicago are in a very unique situation being placed within the boundaries of these neighborhoods, they could be a great tool to connecting students to their neighborhood, but also allowing them to think critically about them as well. So my project is asking two separate questions. If I, yeah. um, how can museums encourage youth to think critically about their built environment? And how can educators' voices be utilized to understand the implementation of such programming? Um, one way to answer this question was through the creation of an educational toolkit. Um, through my own knowledge, research, and investigation of my own neighborhood, I developed five arts-based um, lesson plans that cover six different key concepts of urban planning to understand what truly makes a neighborhood. Uh, from those lesson plans, I created what is called the Building a Neighborhood Toolkit. Um, the intent of this toolkit is to be a resource for museum educators to incorporate urban planning-based projects into their own programs. Um, so similar to the lesson plan and the curriculum that I created, this toolkit um, is divided into six, sec six sections. Um, it covers neighborhood planning, housing, amenities, green spaces, transportation, and zoning. 
Um, each of these subsections are broken down into a few different distinct parts. Uh, the first, which is, you know, allow space for an overview of really understanding what these concepts are. For many people, this may be their first introduction to understanding some of these topics or learning about these topics. Um, but then there's also space for students to reflect and take an assessment of the equity and accessibility that does exist within their own neighborhood. Um, from the knowledge that they build, they're then able to construct their own models that represents each of these subsections. So here are some of the examples that I built for my lesson plans. Um, so we have an example of housing over here on the right, um, a library to cover amenities, a park to represent green spaces, and a bus uh, for transportation. And then the, the situation of them all together is an example of zoning. Um, these lessons are all designed in a particular way where if a educator wanted to just focus on housing, they could. So if they wanted to talk about housing and the issues that exist around that within their neighborhood, they can pull just from the housing section. But the inspiration for this toolkit was to create um, separate parts that when they come together will culminate into one large classroom neighborhood. Um, uh, so uh, some of my next steps. <laughs> I'm also still finishing up my research I will be defending in the summer. Um, so the next phase for my project is to gather feedback from museum educators. I really do want this toolkit to serve as a resource for educators to incorporate this kind of, um, these lesson plans into their programming. So I plan on um, sending it out to educators across a variety of institutions just to get, uh, understand the perception and impact that introducing this kind of concept would have amongst their audience. I and mean, from that, I plan on drawing conclusions and I don't have any final findings to share with you, but I do have um, some ideas uh, that, you know, this kind of programming may be more beneficial to smaller to mid-sized institutions that are located within particular neighborhoods opposed to downtown, um, since they have more capabilities of connecting with the students that are situated in the neighborhoods that they are placed in. Um, additionally, I hope there's opportunities for me to conduct the lesson plans that I, I wrote. Um, for this project. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do so during the course of this project, but um, with the institution that I currently work at, the Chicago Architecture Center, I think there's plenty of opportunities for me to work with our education department to incorporate some of these programs or some of this, these lesson plans into our programs to continue encouraging our students to think critically about their neighborhoods as well. Um, I have a QR code here if anybody wants to download the uh, toolkit that I created, but I have some physical copies as well to share at the end of this if everybody wants to take a look. Um, thank you. Hello, my name is Nan Green, and today I will be presenting my thesis paper, Labor on Display, the Exhibition of U.S. Art Objects and the Museum of Labor's Unionization. Before I begin, I would like to start by thanking my committee, chaired by Dr. Lucy Menza, as well as Drs. Maria Eugenia Lopez Garcia, Therese Quinn, and Peter Alter of the Chicago History Museum. Additionally, I would like to thank Anthony Stepter and Drs. Jenny Breyer and Chesbron for their support, as well as my wonderful family and friends who are present today. When I began graduate school, in the news program, I was interested in learning how cultural workers could better advocate for themselves and the communities that they serve. After following the current museal unionization movement, I consider this to be a possible solution. This brings me to my central investigation of the thesis, why are unions imperative in the fight against US museum classism and the repression of labor? To answer this question, I used intersectional Marxist frameworks to analyze artworks and exhibitions within three museum collections, the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. All of these objects included in the paper exemplify labor through the visual depiction of labor, the status of any art object as the product of artistic labor and or the object involvement in museal labor, which I get into more in the interview sections. While the DIA owns art depicting labor, such as the Diego Rivera mural, and interprets it along these lines, it is not necessarily an indication that DIA leadership is pro-labor. In fact, it is quite the opposite. DIA staff action, an organization of current and former DIA employees, aims to hold the museum leadership accountable to various issues of harassment, union busting, retaliation, and general workplace toxicity. The work that the IA staff action has done and continues to do through open letters 
and social media activism is commendable. However, without a legal body of workers with which to check leadership's power, it does not appear to be as effective as one would hope. For my research at AIC, I interviewed two union members. Interviewee B explained that when members of the security team attempted to unionize in the 90s, the entire team was fired and replaced by contractors as contractors are non-union eligible. Later, the economic recession of 2008 shrunk the workforce even further with layoffs. When the COVID-19 pandemic layoffs inspired a renewed push to unionization at AIC, leadership brought in anti-union lawyers. Despite this, in January of 2020, they won their union, which includes over 500 workers at both the Art Institute of Chicago Museum, as well as the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The union, AIC Workers United, or AIC WU, has established and protected content equity groups, worker-led sessions that invite community members and to co-interpret collection objects, such as pottery created by enslaved ceramicist David Drake. AIC Wu is fighting for increased access to communal cultural heritage. Regarding this new level of transparency, AIC Wu has established, interviewee B says, it's important for the public that enters these museums to understand the context of how work makes its way to the wall. The same way that, you know, you buy a sweater in a retail shop. That heightens the importance of making labor visible in museum spaces because of the archival role of museums. I also interviewed two workers from the Philadelphia Museum of Art traveling to view their collection and special exhibitions. When leadership refused to settle on a contract, the union strategically launched a strike in the onset of blockbuster exhibition Matisse in the 1930s. Resulting in a successful contract, which resulted in higher minimum wage, wage increases across the board, specific language on diverse hiring practices, maternity and paternity leave, and more. The exhibition Macho Men, Hypermasculinity in Dutch and American Prince, explicitly discussed labor and its object interpretation, and even included a special acknowledgement for all the museum workers who participated and created the show. Museum workers at all three sites fought against oppression at their institutions for the betterment of their own material conditions and those of the publics that they serve. Communities were observed to have benefited from museum unionization in three key ways. One, monetarily. Raises and wages found their way back into the communities museum workers go home to after clocking out, generating, generating a quantitative material gain. Two, educationally. Through their shared experience of unionization and non-discrimination policies, union members at AIC and PMA have successfully been able to improve art object interpretation, making for more diverse and inclusive art histories. And three, experientially, museum unions, especially AIC Workers United, have been able to effectively incorporate members of their communities into the interpretive process, creating a method of meaningful Marxist historiography, which is both transparent and accessible. This thesis has already been presented at the Newberry Labor History Seminar and is slated to be presented this June at the Working Class Studies Association Symposium here on the West Campus. Currently, I am editing my paper for potential publication at the German Journal, um, and I am greatly looking forward to continuing investigating American art through intersectional Marxist analysis, the museum unionization movement, and methods for museums to best serve their publics. Thank you so much for your time. Um, hello everyone, my name is Elisa Soto Sanchez, and today I'm going to be presenting my custom project uh, titled Rethinking Narratives in Mexican Contemporary Art Museum. And I want to start by sharing a little bit of how and why I end up with this project. And first, I think everything started with uh, the big impact that the MUSE program had on me, because um, during my classes and through all, all my journey in this program, I learned uh, a lot of new perspectives and ideas about topics, sensitive topics, uh, such as race, gender, in class. And, and with all those ideas, I started questioning myself and also my history, all the history that I knew about my country, that it's Mexico. And also, um, yeah, like uh, questioning my, my, my education, where all the information that, that I have are coming from. And also I started to question, well, and what about museums? Are museums also questioning about these topics 
or are they sharing the same idea that we have learned through all of our life in Mexico through education and through, um, yeah. So, so for this project, I decided to analyze labels inside museum. And why labels? Well, I think labels are one of the main ways that museums share uh, information with, with the audience. And also when you go to a museum and you are curious about it, a certain artwork, you go to the label and look for more information. But what happened when we think about who is writing those uh, those labels? Because uh, the people that write them are like you and me that have uh, beliefs and um, political ideologies and also a cultural background. So when we uh, share this information and the people uh, write this label, we are reinforcing the same ideas if we are not aware of our bias. Um, so to do this, I took a journey through Mexican history and, and I used feminist theories and uh, Latin American critical theories as well to, to guide me through my research. And also, um, uh, and while I was doing this, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, I use these uh, theories to to work on my in, on my project, and something that I uh, found was a lot of connection, as as you can see here. And I was able to understand fully understand those topics and how they are immersed in the Mexican society and the culture. Um, and through my research as well, I realized that contemporary art museums are part of a breaking point in the, in the Mexican cultural history because around the, the 90s um, in Mexico, uh, the government stopped being the one in charge of controlling the museums and the funding for those uh, institutions. So with this, uh, I, I in, we had uh, for the first time uh, museums that were uh, private institutions and with those institutions, you, well, the people controlling those museums were able to, to share a different perspective, not the ideas that the government was telling us. So, um, so when I realized about that, I decided to use uh, contemporary art museums as my place for uh, research, because I thought that that was great. Like maybe here I can find these new ideas and new topics about, uh, um, yeah, like challenging all those narratives and sharing different perspectives. So for my, I, I perform a museum analysis and I picked three museums, one private institution, uh, two private institutions and one public uh, museum. And um, I went there and I analyzed the labels and I analyzed around five uh, exhibitions through, through around these three museums. And I do find a lot of uh, these narratives, for example, uh, labels diminishing indigenous people, and also reinforcing gender roles, um, and like also dividing uh, the society among their um, social classes. So, yeah, I was curious about that. But also, I found that, for example, the Calus Museum was doing a great job of uh, introducing new topics about feminism and inclusion. Something that I found uh, that I uh, common through for these three uh, museums is that they are uh, lacking uh, or, or they have problems when it comes for uh, at, uh, creating labels because there are like technicalities they are not doing the correct way. For example, using too much text in just one label, or there are problems with the legibility of those, of those labels. So with all this information, I decided to create a digital guide that summarizes all the information that I collected through my research. And uh, also, I think this digital guide is gonna be useful for museum workers and emerging museologists that are not familiar with this with all the like all the layers 
that are uh, immersed in this topic. So when they are creating a label, they're gonna be able to identify them and ask themselves, are, what are, what's the intention or what I'm using this for or this language? Um, so uh, I think it's important because it, it will open the conversation in Mexico about these topics. And also it's uh, a tangible way to affect a change. So thank you so much for your attention. Hello, uh, my name is Mai. I'm here today to present my capstone project. Uh, my capstone project is a science and imagination from China's Lab Science uh, exhibition about leaching era of science stations. Um, uh, just to give people some uh, uh, historical background uh, about the, this era, uh, Qing Dynasty is the last imperial dynasty in China, uh, spanned from 1644 to 1911. And in 1911, there is a revolution that overthrew the monarchy system in China. Uh, the late Qing era, referring to the last 70 years uh, uh, of, the, of the Qing dynasty, uh, in, um, from 1840 to 1911. So in 1840, uh, before 1840, China lived in relatively isolation from the world. And in the late Qing era, a chain of events that forced China to engage, seriously engage with the world. And this engagement includes the conflict, trade, and knowledge exchange. As you can see, the, the timeline of the, the events that have been done in the late Qing era, and you can see this time is really marked with the war, revolution, and, and reformation time. Uh, it's a time of, of uh, turbulence time, but also a time of great transformation in China. So this transformation gave birth to the first group of Chinese science fiction books and science fiction writers. <laughs> uh, science fiction as a really new type of literature started popularizing in the 19th century. Uh, it started from the 19th century uh, because the, uh, the two industrial revolution and the colonial expansion during that time. Uh, Chinese sci-fi series can some things. In the past, the environment was really relatively stable in the time span of human, but we now live in a fast changing world. New technology makes chance happen around us every moment, and science fiction is the perfect way to reflect this change. So now in the 19th century, where people feel that uh, uh, social change and technology improve, uh, uh, they really began to change their life uh, and life experience forever. And so in the China, they have their own way, a unique way to um, that experience this change and the technology improvement. For, for example, like railroad, steamship, and also engagement with, with the world, poor invasion, colonial settlement, and migrant workers. Uh, so this goes to, into like their thought how we think about future and technology. Uh, here is the list of the uh, science fiction books that I include in, in that become part of my research. Uh, so my focus, my focus in this project, how to how can I present the work to work to the people and the public? Uh, in my observation, I I noticed that many Western sci-fi, especially American sci-fi, become popular not only because the uh, uh, the original text, but also uh, their their presence on other forms of media, including like the movies, uh, TV shows, and video games. Uh, so in this project, I intend to take the text from the from what I read from the late era science fiction and turn it into visual visual things like the object and uh, and images. So because my uh, problem statement, how can an exhibition of late nineteen science fiction work to present an alternative perspective on sci-fi and provoke people's interest in this genre? Uh, here's my uh, exhibition. Uh, includes, so in my, this uh, exhibition, I include three books. I think are representative of this era uh, of, science, of science fiction in China: Electric, uh, Electric Wars, A New Order's Memoir, and New China. So, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit small. Uh, so here's my uh, thought process when I design, began to design and uh, uh, the, uh, my my exhibition, the object. Uh, so from uh, book text and I began uh, how they describe an object for the uh, and the images and then become ideation 
I'll design and add some like style for it, uh, what I think is uh, uh, probable to to my design. And if you can see the introduction of the materials and its output. Uh, so here's the, the like a intro part, intro level for my exhibition about like a talk about error information. Um, so here's the like the object at the, that will be planned on in the exhibition and it with labels. So in this design, I intend to stay honest with the author, but also add from my own uh, imaginations. So here's the like the plan exhibition that will be on the, the fifth floor gallery, but because of time and my co the cost, I'm able to I'm unable to realize it. So I but I have the three D writing in here too. And here's the like the posters uh of that design for the exhibition. And also on the outside, I have the object, some of the objects made uh, uh, for the exhibition. Right, thank you. So I thank you all for those presentations. Uh, let's start with questions in the audience. What questions do you all have? Thank you so much for these awesome presentations and also for, um, to the previous group. Just so fascinating for me that I'm so far outside this field, and I love the wealth of connections to literary studies, which is my own. This is a question for Elisa. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you consider to be a good label? Like, what is what what are the what are the right contents for a label in an exhibition? And maybe could you talk a little bit about a little bit more about your digital? project and does it do that kind of thing like here's a bad label, <laughs> and here's a bad label. um uh like does it have that kind of practical purpose to it okay so the first question about um what yeah what are the ingredients yeah well first i think we can start with the, the style and the design that should be a, a short label that is thinking about uh, about the, the, the visitor and not about uh, like we as curators or museum workers. We need to, to share information with the audience that they really are interested in. So I think first, short, ex uh, short labels that are accessible in many ways, not only through text, um, and also that the, the design is legible and the, everything, the lighting is good, and about content, I think, um, yeah, well, it's hard. I mean, every label is different and every exhibition is different. But I think that something, something that is important is to, uh, yeah, think about the visitor and also talk like about a, a story. I mean, it's not only like explaining the object and what, is, what anyone can see. Tell me a little bit about this history. How can I connect with those uh, artworks or with those uh, objects? And tell me how they are connected with the, with the community and the person, not only like, yeah, this is from blah, blah, blah. So yeah. And about the digital guide, um, no, it's not that like you are doing a bad job. <laughs> so at the beginning, that was like my, my idea, but I was like, no, I cannot say, if it's wrong or good. What I can say is give some advice and let people take decisions and think about, question themselves and are you really want to share this information? Here, here's the context. Are you sure we're going to do this? And yeah. Thank you. Other questions in the audience? Questions? As you were all speaking, maybe everybody today, but I was really thinking about it with this last group of four presenters that each one of you is addressing a huge social structure in some ways. You're talking about labor repression or labor rights, labor movements. Uh, we're hearing about uh, neighborhood segregation, I think in a sense, is sort of at the core of what you're talking about, Lexi. 
We're hearing also about national narratives, uh, really the big stories that nations tell about themselves. And, and in Jahan's case, really uh, about these kind of ideas that we are able to have or maybe not to have uh, as paradigms shift um, and move us to, to a new future. You know, we're always in these kind of scientific change moments. So I wonder for each of you, how are you thinking about the, like moving from the big, big structure to like a concrete thing that you want to see happen next? Or what, what's one thing that you're going to be doing next with this idea, with the big idea that you're addressing? Sorry, <laughs> from the sun. Um, I think, well, I feel like I'm still kind of figuring that out. But one thing that I feel like museums currently aren't doing the best at is engaging directly with the communities that they're in. I feel like there's not enough dialogue happening, particularly with the students that in the, the youngest demographic of, of children that go into these museums and these institutions. I feel like uh, children are have such unique perspectives and you know have a lot to offer the institution as well. And I feel like there's a very like unilateral relationship that currently exists with museums and students. And I think some people are trying to kind of deconstruct that, but I think we need to see a bit more of that and allowing students to take more power and ownership over their own education, but also by in doing so by talking about topics that are, are relevant to them and their community in the moment. Uh, well, first, I think my project is going to be useful for me. <laughs> <laughs> I learned quite much through all my, uh, my, uh, through all my research. And I think that's gonna be great for me when I start to work on those museums and I can provide new ideas. Um, I'm currently uh, doing an internship at the Chicago History Museum and I'm able to incorporate some of those ideas and also when they are translating labels, I have been able to, to talk about uh, the Spanish version. So I think uh, I'm, I'm interested in doing that. And also to help uh, create a way that, uh, yeah, the labels share uh, a story with the, with the audience. And for example, in contemporary art museums that sometimes the artwork seems so abstract and people feel like, well, I don't understand this. So I'm just gonna keep talking. So um, I think by incorporating those ideas, those narratives in, in also contemporary art museums. I think that while we're all talking about these like very large, sometimes abstract ideas like capitalism, um, the the effort that goes into unionizing and maintaining a union in a workspace is a large effort, but it is an effort made up of individual people who are all united about like just care about each other and about the communities that they serve. And at the end of the day, I hope that like through my interviews, through um, being able to observe like the contemporary push in unionization at museums, I'm able to, you know, just publicly display work from, you know, the Midwest and the East Coast and wherever else I'm able to um, fun travel to in the future that like this is work that is happening. There are people who are making this a reality and just keeping that hope alive, sharing the amazing work that is taking place across the country and across the world right now. Um, I, I think it is, um, I, I'm honored to have that responsibility. Uh, so, uh, so my topic is about, about science fiction. As I said, in, as I said in my presentation, science fiction is a way to people reflect uh, how they feel about social change and change of technology. But uh, how people experience the change in, it will be different based on their geographical locations and their social status. Uh, and, uh, and how China, and how Chinese uh, uh, the colonial how people experience the Chinese from the colonial West and uh, nations like China and other plantations being colonized by the West, they are different. I think their story needs to be heard and told. Uh, uh, and then I, I talk with some Chinese uh, sci-fi clients and they, uh, they they kind of we have uh, they, uh, we all watch a lot of Western sci-fi. They kind of fit up with the, a lot of reference on like Christian religion, Western sci-fi, and they want like a, the own, uh, the kind of representation, their own concern to be being hosting more science fiction work like that. Hey, 
thank you all so much. I really enjoyed these presentations. Um, I have I have one question for Lexi and one for Elisa, Elisa uh, if that's okay. Um, Lexi, I love your project so much. The um the sort of trying to understand sort of what makes a neighborhood and actually to to sort of bring it to the youth, have them think about it in the in the museum context. Um, and I love you know these different components that you sort of brought us in terms of in terms of components that actually build up sort of a neighborhood. Um, in the seminar that I was teaching this semester on, on the environment and, and Anthropocene, we were talking a lot about walking as a, as a spatial practice, walking that, as something that makes up and builds, as a cultural practice that um, built space, right, in the urban, urban environment. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about if those kind of more softer aspects of urban space, like uh, graffiti or walking, those kind of cultural practices have any, um, uh, what role they play, you know, in this kind of, in your conceptualization of, of the neighborhood? Yeah, so I think, I think particularly focusing on you mentioned walking, I think that has a huge role in a neighborhood and what is what allows opportunities for us to feel connected for a neighborhood and feel connected to, to you know, the people within it. And also just feel a general sense of safety by being able to, to navigate in a way that doesn't rely heavily on, on cars and other senses of transportation. Um, I think it's important to address that. And I feel like in my section that talks about transportation, I do try to, in like I leave it up for some, uh, you know, allowing students to kind of come up with some of those ideas on their own. I feel like through like assessing and, and uh, thinking about what is currently in their neighborhood um, and kind of understanding why things are like that or how it could be different, um, there's an opportunity for them to kind of maybe come to some of those conclusions. But I really do, um, within the construction of my toolkit, I, I do try to encourage ed educators to kind of plant seeds for some of those ideas, um, just so students can think about, you know, not just what is, but what could we be. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank you, thank you so much. I was thinking about like really bringing to them something like, you know, the like, situationists, uh, situationists international and their, their way of talking about some walking as a radical practice. I, I think that some of, some of that is sort of coming back, which is really very exciting, so. Thank you for your task. One more question. Lisa, I really, I loved, you showed us this kind of beautiful flow chart in your presentation. I got so excited about it. So I, I also think through flow charts and as a method, could you say a few things about like how that helps your research as a method of working with institutions and this kind of histories? Um, I just really like that so much. So I wanted to sort of well, give you some. Well, thank we yeah. because <laughs> you know, during our rehearsal, she mentioned that that will be interesting to include in the in the in your presentation, and I was like, well, maybe that's a little bit confusing for people. But thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of my uh, of my website. Well, the digital right? And that's the way. Yeah, that's the way that I connect things, and I was able to find that. Oh my God! And this is connected to this, and that helped me to understand everything. And then when I went to the museums, I was able to to really understand what I was looking for. Okay, because at the beginning it was like um, ideas of decolonization, but why is that? I mean, I need something more tangible. So yeah, it helped me way too much. Thank you. Questions? As everyone said, this has been really great. Thank you. Um, so Leanne, I, I wanted to ask, I, I think what's really compelling for me was what you were talking about at the end of your presentation about how the unionizing, if, if I understood it, the museum workers are doing is potentially transforming the museum experience. Um, so like the experiential and the educational benefits. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Are there any examples that maybe illustrate some of that transformation? Oh, there's so much. So. Um, Oh man, like where do we even start? I, I really think that especially at AIC with the content equity groups, and there's just so much background about those. So the School of the Art Institute had content equity groups and the school leadership got rid of them. After that happened, unionization was put forth and um, the museum and the school were both joined together in their union. And interviewee A was saying that especially for them, 
the union was in an important way of protecting these content equity points. So it, it could help like legally ensure that they would exist and that members of the community can come in and co-interpret objects that are in the collection. So like really making these museums public as they claim to be engaging in this sort of like co-curation. And it's something that was also seen at PMA with the Mashaman exhibition, the curatorial fellow, Dr. Jun Nakamura, who led that exhibition development, um, talked a lot about being inspired by the strike and interviewees D and C, who I interviewed there as well, were also talking about how that like shared experience of labor really helped them uh, make visible the work that they are doing that they want to be able to communicate with their publics, but because of like the class dialectics that exist within museums with like leadership being, you know, higher paid, mostly male, mostly white, there's this break in communication where, you know, I, I was able to observe that unions really help legally protect the sort of like diverse and inclusive interpretation that they're putting into effect at both AIC and PMA. Excellent. We have time for maybe one more question. Is there a burning question in the audience? No, we are at 15 minutes. So uh, I want to thank the folks that presented. Um, not everyone in the cohort presented today. There's a fantastic uh, cohort that is graduating this year. So I just want to say uh, it's been great to hear these presentations. I hope everyone enjoys graduation tomorrow. But just please join me in thanking these, uh, these presenters. Um, so again, just congratulations. I, I think we should all just one more cheer.